Okay, so um, in my group, we've been doing experiments to measure the density fluctuations in strange metals. Uh, we have new data that I'm going to show you that I'm trying to understand. Um, one of my colleagues who's a high energy physicist said he was going to come to this talk and bring some high energy physicists with him. Is he, are you alone or did any? Okay, well, I put in two slides for the high energy physicist just saying what a strange metal is. It's just practice for non experts. Um, so, to understand what's intriguing about a strange metal, it's useful to reflect on what is a normal metal. So, normal, the, to me, the definition of normal is whatever is in Ashcroft and Merman. So, Ashcroft and Merman, chapter 17, describes the scattering rate in strange metals. And the basic picture is if I have a spherical Fermi surface and I consider the scattering of an electron, say E1 near the surface, it will scatter by exciting electron E2 uh, that's beneath the Fermi C. And if you just ask how much phase space is available uh, to that electron as a function of energy distance from the Fermi energy, it goes like E squared. And then if you uh, add temperature, it's uh, uh, essentially the quadrature, some of these from some convolution. And this assumes there's no momentum kinematics at all. You can just reach whatever momentum you'd like. So the whole momentum relaxation part of the problem that's non-trivial. But basically, if you ask then what's the resistivity of a normal metal, that's the low energy limit. So the resistivity should just be T squared. And if you add phonons, it should be T to the fifth, except at really high temperature, you can get T linear. You might say, well, can I just get T linear from? What's I think the answer to the question is no, I cannot correct Ashcroft and Merman. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if you see something that's T linear over decades, it's weird, because that means that theta D is not doing anything. Okay. Um, fine. I have a lot of data to show, so let, <laughs> let me dodge these questions. Um, the second aspect of what's normal is uh, the resistivity should saturate in a normal metal. So uh, it can't go to infinity. Um, and so the scattering rate, in other words, the scattering rate can't become infinite. It's always bounded by the mean free path. The mean free path can't get smaller than the distance between electrons or the lattice parameter. Are you leaving out of protest or? Okay. So there's a limit which is fundamental. The limit which is fundamental, <laughs> I'm taking my five minutes at the end, uh, which is the mott yoffa regel limit. Um, it, once the electron mean free path is, it can't be shorter than the distance between electrons because there's nothing to scatter from. So um, in, in things like copper, you can never reach it because the material melts before it ever gets there. But in other simpler low density metals, uh, they saturate as expected, and that's described in this um, really nice review article that many of you have surely read. Okay, so um, what's odd about a strange metal? The resistivity is linear, and it's linear over decades. There's discussions about how many decades, um, but that is, uh, so it's not T squared, and it doesn't seem to do anything in vicinities where the Debye temperature may or may not be the right quantity to compare to. Um, and also, it exceeds the mott yoffa regel limit, so the resistivity just blows through this. There are materials where it actually exceeds it by close to a factor of 10, which means that an electron scatters 10 times before it reaches the next electron. And what does that mean exactly? Um, okay, so if also, all right, so there's a lot more to say. The, uh, we, as we heard, the conductivity is, is a power law form, and we saw this, um, what's it called, power law liquid type behavior. Uh, that ZX and, and later Dan Dessau have seen. And um, at one point, the strange metal was considered to be high TC physics, but we now know this thing exists in a lot of different materials. So um, terbium aluminum boron-4, terbium rhodium-2 silicon tube, twisted by their graphene, maybe organic materials. So it seems to be a phase. Okay, so um, what can cause this? So in the late 80s, early 90s, there was this conjecture called the marginal Fermi liquid hypothesis, is what I'm going to call it. And it was a guess about what is the functional behavior of the dielectric response of the system. So epsilon is the dielectric constant. It's 1 minus V pi. Pi is the polarizability. And the conjecture was pi has this nonsensical form, where 
It's frequency, it's linear in frequency with a slope of one over T up to the temperature and then constant after that up to a cutoff, which is some really high energy scale, half an EV or more. So this makes no sense because any Lindhard calculation of the response would show something highly frequency and momentum dependent. So it really makes no sense. It's sort of incompatible fundamentally with the existence of propagating particles in the system. But it explains lots of experiments. So the T linear resistivity comes out, power law, conductivity, the lifetime in ARPES, lots of different things. So to me, there's an experimental question, which is just, is this real? I mean, that's, we should be able to measure this and see if it happens. Um, for the high energy physicists, I'm gonna send the slides. This is how you get all that stuff out of that assumption. So I'm not gonna go through this, but I'm putting it in here just for completeness. Um, there's a whole story of the magnetic field dependence, the magneto resistance that doesn't fit into this framework, which is another topic that I'm also not gonna get into. Okay, so let's talk about what is seen in experiment. So I'm gonna focus on measurements of the dielectric response and I'll just get in the habit of plotting the inverse dielectric response because that's mostly what we measure with scattering. So if you plot, if you take the data that you saw in Eric's talk, that was measured by Dirk van der Marl, who's sitting right there, then which, and then you in, take the inverse and the imaginary part, you get a peak. So this is normal. So this is sort of in the optimally dope system. This is BISCO 2212 and this peak is a plasma, okay? So that's what you expect to have in a normal metal. And this has been known for many years. It's not a normal plasma because it derives from the conductivity. The conductivity is non-druta, has a power law form and a scattering rate that's linear in omega, suitably defined scattering rate. And um, so the question is, but at first glance, it doesn't look too odd, but there's a question, what does this thing do at finite momentum? And in particular, just at first glance, it looks very little like this, right? But the key difference is this is a Q equals zero measurement. The conjecture from marginal Fermi liquid that was that this lives everywhere in the Brouillon zone at all finite momenta. So you have to do a finite momentum measurement to know if it happens or not. So this is the experiment set up in my lab. We call it a MEALS. Um, it's a variant on HR EELS, which is a technique developed in the 1970s in Ulich by uh, Harold Ebach and coworkers. What we did is we basically gave it the degrees of freedom that you would need to do um, real scattering, like neutron scattering. So it has a triple axis sample goniometer and I won't get into all the details because I don't have that much time. But basically you could think of it as like skipping a pebble off of a pond. So you have to prepare a surface, you take an electron, you shoot it at the surface, it scatters and it creates a collective mode. You measure the energy momentum transferred to that electron and you can see if there are excitations present. So the resolution is six MeV, so we can study the infrared excitations, the momentum resolution is similar to photomission and so on. And basically the cross section is some matrix elements which have been calculated analytically, um, not by us, by uh, Doug Mills in the 70s, times the density density correlation function of the surface. And then S is related to a susceptibility which is related to what those early authors um, spoke about times a Bose factor. So this is the fluctuation dissipation theorem in the limit that this is Q independent this chi double prime is proportional to the imaginary part of one over epsilon plus one, where that epsilon is the bulk dielectric constant. So this is a bulk probe. We have to have a conversation about what that means, um, but um, it's by measuring the properties of a material through its surface. Okay, so every time I talk about strange metals, somebody says, have you ever done a Fermi liquid? So I just add this slide now as standard. This is a, what a Fermi liquid looks like. So this is bismuth selenide. This was a failed attempt to measure the spin surface plasmon that Ragu predicted, Sri Ragu, who's also here in 2010. So this was done in the time when bismuth selenide had very serious problems with selenium vacancy, so they were highly electron doped. And the consequence of that is you just see plasmons. So it's just a doped semiconductor, basically. So, um, basic, but, so here's what you see. So, that, so if you, this is omega energy on this axis. Positive is energy loss, negative is energy gain. There's always a big peak at zero because there's lots of static density in the system. And then if you look at finite frequency, then you'll see a plasma, and that's what you would expect in a normal metal. And then if you anneal the system to change the number of carriers in it, you can shift this plasma around. So if you add carriers, it shifts to higher frequency. If you plot the square of the plasma frequency against the density measured with Hall effect, you get a line. And the line gives you the effective mass and everything works. These are different dopings. So, 
the moments is all that they're all small q. Yeah, if you measure the q dependence of this, it's pretty constant. This is actually a surface plasmon, and it doesn't disperse much. It just sort of broadens as a function of q. I probably should put that. Right, and I just answered that, and that's what I just said. Yeah, so it doesn't really disperse, and surface plasmons don't. Okay, so um, I've so we have new data that I'm going to show in this talk. I'm going to focus on the optimally doped material. That I'll reference the other ones, and uh, all the data that I've pu we've published up to now was done with a momentum resol resolution that looks like this. So this is a phase space plot of the beam. So this is the angle of the opening angle of the beam, and then the energy. And ideally, you'd like to have a nice compact thing. Um, it actually, if you zoom in, the, uh, the way the old experiments were done, this had a chirp on it. Um, a few years ago, we learned how to fix this chirp, and now that's what the phase space area looks like. So the resolutions, the measurements you're going to see now have something like a factor of five times better momentum resolution and about two and a half times better energy resolution than what you'd seen before. This is going to allow us to see the omega over T region of the spectrum. Okay, so this is an elastic scattering map. So this is momentum in X and Y. This is all done at omega equals zero. So this is our version of a ARPA's Fermi surface plot where you just map moment, momentum space at zero frequency. And you see a lot of familiar things. So there's a one zero Bragg peak, and then you see a bunch of super lattice reflections, which are from the supermodulation in the system, which is always present. Those are the things that give you the ghost bends in photomission. So we like to see those because they should be there. Um, and uh, so we're, I'm, we're going to focus on data taken along this direction, which is rather quiet because it's 45 degrees from the supermodulation. Has 2 pi or no Ooh, pi? Yeah, okay, good question. So, um, sorry, I'm going fast. This is in reciprocal lattice units. It's neutron scattering units. So one over this is the wavelength in lattice parameters. So one is the center of the next Brillouin zone. 0.5 is the Brillouin zone boundary in tetragonal units. Okay, so I've had a lot of questions about whether the data we see is consistent with optics. So we've already seen what epsilon does at zero, for zero momentum. So we spend a lot of time working on that, and I forgot to put the reference on this slide. It's on the next one. But um, here's what the data look like now at very small momentum. So these are the momenta in reciprocal lattice units. So one over this is the wavelength in lattice parameters. You can see the numbers are now very small. So the Highest one is 0.1, so that's 10 lattice parameters, and then they go down to 100. Okay, so it's quite high resolution. At very small momentum, what you see is a funny looking tail, and then as you increase Q, you see a bump. And the bump is at around an EV, but not exactly, so you might guess that could be related to the plasmon seen in optics. And then at higher Q, it decays into something that looks like just a continuum that's frequency independent. That is, um, rather disturbingly similar to marginal Fermi liquid in that sense. Um, okay, so the first thing I'd like to point out is that the matrix elements at very small momentum are very frequency dependent. So if you just plot the prefactor that I showed you on the earlier plot as a function of Q, you can see at really small Qs it has this tail. Okay, so this rapidly falling tail is just from the matrix elements, which you can divide out in principle. Um, so then, um, okay, so the question is, is this thing the same as Dirk van der Marl's plasmon, or I don't know who discovered it, or is it something else? So we spent a lot of time on this, a couple of years, and um, we can show that everything agrees. So what we did is we used this old framework, which was actually developed for semiconductor super lattices. So this is from Janendra Jain and Phil Allen. And this was for analyzing Aaron Penzik's Raman scattering measurements from gallium arsenide two dag arrays from the 80s. Aaron's my hero, so I'm happy to really uh, to work on this. And uh, so basically what they did is they calculated the density response of a semi-infinite layered system um, from analytically from basic principles. So they just postulated there's some polarizability of a layer, and then they did the rest analytically, all these A's, B's, C's, and D's, there's closed form expressions for all these things. And what this, and this pi naught, is actually related to the epsilon measured in, in optics, just plain old optics. So what we did is we took Dirk's epsilon of omega data, which he sent us graciously, calculated pi naught, plugged it into these formulas, put in the matrix elements, 
And then you have to convolve with the momentum and energy resolution of the instrument, which is known because I showed it to you on the earlier plot. And then you can make a comparison without any adjustable parameters and ask, are these data from Fandemarl consistent with eels? And now here's the interesting thing. Eels is momentum dependent, okay? So we only know from optics what this thing is at Q equals zero. But nevertheless, you can pretend that that thing is Q independent, put it in the formulas and just compare and see you know, do they agree on the small Q limit, and then how far up in Q can you go and still get agreement? So this was sort of the idea. So, high, so postulating that this is momentum independent, what you get is this. So the figures on the so the figures on the right is our data that I showed you on the previous slide. The solid lines are just calculations of this formula, putting in the matrix elements and the momentum resolution. You can see the agreement is quite good. The only adjustable parameter here is the overall scale, which has to be adjusted because of the units are different. And, uh, but you can see the tail comes through. That's just from the matrix elements. And this bump is the plasma. Okay? So it's in the, for momenta smaller than about 0.04, um, I think everything looks good. So our data agree with optical data. And you'd say up to that point, the optical data are actually the same, uh, valid at finite momentum, up to this momentum value. Above that, things go off the rails. Ooh, I'm already at five minutes. Okay, almost done. <laughs> Above that, things go off the rails. The agreement becomes, I'm not almost done. Um, <laughs> the agreement becomes quite poor. So if you go to larger Q then and ask, what do things look like up there? Everything's very momentum independent. And what you see is, so this is just a, Q of 0.18, there's a big peak at zero frequency. There are a couple of phonons. These are the things that give you the kinks in photomission. They show up right at the frequencies that ZX told us they should and Tom Devereaux 20 years ago. And underneath that is a continuum that's for constant. It's very hard to get, it's easy to get peaks that are broad. It's hard to get functions that are constant in spectroscopy. So let's keep scanning. You go out to 600 EV, it's still there. Let's go to a vault, still constant. How far do I have to go? I'm out of time, so I guess I'll just sit down now. I haven't even showed you the data. Um, so there's a cutoff about an EV, and then it decays like a power law, roughly one over omega squared, a little faster. If you ask over what region of the phase diagram is this continuum present, the answer is, you can't see it on this plot, it's present every, we've mapped the whole phase diagram, you see it in a fan centered at optimal doping. That's where you get this. So I don't know if it's related to superconductivity or a quantum critical point or anything. This is an empirical statement. That's where it is. If you go out here, everything's very strongly temperature dependent and frequency dependent. That was published in 2019. Um, okay, so uh, we wrote several papers on this. According to my watch, I still have 10 minutes. Is that not true? Oh, okay. All right. Um, I'll take a few minutes for the question time. There will still be time left. Okay, so we've had lots of questions. So that all pertains to what's happening up here. So we've had lots of questions. What happens down here? We have much better resolution now, so we should be able to see that. So let's go look at low frequency. So this is now in, uh, so this is 0 to 150 milli EV full scale. This is just the raw data. This is the correlation function. Remember, you measure a correlation function. This is not the susceptibility. It's related to the susceptibility by a fluctuation dissipation theorem. And if you look out here, this is the continuum. It's quite weak. These are the phonons. And then if you go to zero, this is the peak. That's the big zero loss peak that I showed you earlier. If the resolution is good enough, what you can show is that the width of this thing is temperature dependent now. Okay, so that's not really a zero loss peak. They're quasi-elastic, static, not semi-static, but which means dynamic processes hiding inside that elastic line and the energy scale of them is order the temperature. Okay, so how can we compare them to conjectures about marginal Fermi liquid? What you have to do is anti-symmetrize. So if you want to take out the Bose factor, easiest way to do it is just take S of omega minus S of minus omega and it drops out. The advantage of doing it this way is it doesn't require exact knowledge of the temperature. You can, so you can't, you know, you don't need to just divide. So that gives us chi double prime. So if you, that takes us from the left plot to the right. And then you can see some things that are kind of intriguing. There's a, here's the continuum, there's a peak, and then there's a wiggle down there, that's a resolution effect. So the grade region is where resolution effects are sort of relevant. And then you can see as you cool, so red is room temperature, 
Purple is low temperature. As you cool, there's a peak here, and the peak grows, and it actually shifts to lower frequency and gets stronger. Okay, so it doesn't look exact, but the slope of this thing gets steeper. So there is a sort of prefactor with a slope of 1 over t, but it doesn't have exactly the functional form that Chandra and coworkers told us it would. Um, so then there's a question, what fits this peak? So we started exploring different functional forms that might describe this thing. And uh, there are two that work quite well. The first one is this relaxation diffusion function that's right out of Chaikin Lubensky. This is called model A. So this basically just is generic. If I have a scalar order parameter that exhibits relaxational dynamics, it should fit something like this. Gamma is a scattering, is a scattering rate. And this actually fits the data really nicely. It gives you the peak and everything. And what this allows us to do, and if you take gamma of Q, what the textbooks tell you is it should have two pieces. It should have a relaxation parameter, which is just pure dissipation, and then a diffusion term, which would be Q-dependent. Okay, so if this thing is Q-dependent, then there's a, that implies there's diffusion in the problem, too. And you can actually get out a diffusion constant if you fit that. And the thing that we found is if you take this gamma and plot it as a function of Q, it has a minimum. So it's also very temperature dependent. Okay, so this tau naught is temperature dependent. The D is temperature dependent. And there is a minimum, but it's not at zero, which is what you'd expect for normal diffusion. It's actually at non-zero Q. So the, all the dynamics are basically parameters by a tau naught, a D, and a Q naught. And there aren't a lot of scatterers in this room, but if there were, you would jump up and down and say, I know what that is. That's de called degen narrowing. So I learned this because I did experiments with Sonny Sinho as a soft condensed matter physicist. And what a peak, what a minimum at finite Q means is there is, is it's a structured liquid. I still have six minutes. If you take liquid water and you do the, this experiment in liquid water with x-rays or something, or neutrons, it looks exactly the same. There's a zero loss line. The width of the thing depends on temperature. And if you measure its width as a function of Q, it has a minimum at 2 inverse angstrom. And 2 inverse angstrom is the inverse of the size of a water molecule. And what does it mean? It means that at some wave vector, because water is a rigid object, at wave vectors that are the inverse of the size of the water molecule, the fluctuations on average are slower because a water molecule is a rigid object. Okay? So this means that it's a, that it looks like a structured liquid. It's a conducting state, but there's a minimum at Q naught that is sort of characterized the size of a little blob. So it looks like a, something like water, but where the blobs are the inverse of this Q naught. So it's valuable to look at these. Yeah, so this is called the Gen narrowing. There's papers written about this. Debanjan has a really interesting paper on jamming dynamics that actually sort of replicates our data just published in Nature Communications. I promised him I'd plug it here. Um, please take a look at that. And um, the intriguing thing comes when you plot what are the properties of these functions. So, there, so D turns out to just be a constant. It doesn't depend on temperature. Um, Tau naught is highly temperature dependent. If you plot tau naught, it's actually linear. And if you fit it, tau naught is alpha KBT over H bar alpha is 0.38. That's actually the same as this alpha in transport. So this thing is Planckian. And Q naught is sort of the size of whatever the blobs are. I don't know what they are. And it's uh, slightly temperature dependent too, but its size is something like, well, it's 0.5 or so. It's roughly two lattice parameters in size. So it's like a liquid made of little blobs, two lattice parameters in size that when they flow, collide off of one another, and they exhibit some Planckian dissipation and some jamming kind of physics that makes them have a minimum. Still have three minutes. Last slide. There is omega t scaling in here if you look. So if you take chi and you set, if you look at q equals q naught, chi, this is the fit function, and you factor out a 1 over t, this thing is a function of omega over t. And if you, um, so you get omega t scaling in this limit. Actually, it's roughly works at all q. And um, one functional form that fits really well is this thing with the t to the 2 delta minus 1 out front which gives you that rise in the low energy excitations at low temperature. And this is 
So this I got from Tom Faulkner, who's a high energy physicist who wrote a paper on this in 2011. Apparently this comes straight out of conformal field theory. I'd love opinions from people if they could explain to me where this came from, but it fits the data beautifully. And it implies a conformal dimension of 0.03. Marginal Fermi liquid would be, would be delta is one half. So it's not equal to exactly what Chandra said, but it's close. So, all right, in summary, um, a strange metal, at least this one, is a structured liquid. It is made of blobs of charge that are rigid. And when it flows, they collide off of one another, which makes it unsurprising that it would be hard to calculate such a thing from perturbation theory from quasiparticles. If you tried to calculate water by starting with electrons and ions and doing perturbation theory, it would never work because there's a whole layer of chemistry in between. So the size of the clumps is temperature dependent, varies from around 1.6 to 2.2 lattice parameters depending upon temperature, and the fluctuation time scale is really fast. It's about 70 femtoseconds, though that's temperature dependent too, and the flow is sort of jamming-like. And I'm gonna stop there, because I'm out of time. Thank you. Peter? Thanks, uh, Peter. It's a beautiful story. Um, I have a, and I want it to it's be true. It's not a story, it's just data. No, 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 no. no, no There's no, no story. I want it to be true, but I have a question about the error bars. Yeah. And so, particular, like, this is, you know, very evocative about this minimum in Q. Yeah. But uh, when I look at the, I, when I look at the lines. Yeah. There's one thing. But okay. when I look at the data. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's the, the small error well, bars, a lot a, of scatter. I'm not sure I see a minimum. Pick a, let's curve. pick red. Okay. These two points are, are, are higher than these points, and that one is too. I didn't hide the error bars, I'm not hiding anything. If I take the green, it goes from here to here to here to here to here to here. It's got a minimum. If I take purple, it goes from here to here to here to here to here. I need to make a better yeah. plot. I think that's one thing I've taken from this. Each curve has a minimum. Now. So there's no, there's if you take that out, there's still a minimum. Maybe not in the red, but in the, in the other ones. So there's no, the other are there? Ones. And no. we reproduced this. We've done the experiment twice, and you get minima in both of them. It, just very briefly, there's no different with the, with the experiment, experimental issue. There's no different systematics in small Q where something could be strange with the data there. It's, um, it's all the, the same. The data are reproducible. Yeah, we did it no, no, twice. No, that's not the question. Systematics where. You, you well, below, but this is the small smallest Q. Q where you can, where you don't get plasmons, and so you can fit the data with this functional form. If you go to smaller Q, you start getting plasmons, and then the whole spectrum changes, and, and you just can't even describe it that way. Yeah. Hi, Peter. Hi. Um, is Q not isotropic? If you look into, diag say, diagonal direction, do you also see this minimum? Um, I don't know. Okay. We did a diagonal data, the data aren't good enough, I don't know. Okay. The Thanks. continuum itself, if you look at the high energy part, that's isotropic. But I don't know about this part. That's my alarm going off, so just... Okay. We're almost ignore. in the discussion session, so let me ask you one completely stupid question for discussion. This is about high frequency part, yeah. not the low frequency part. Yeah. You said it pretty much consistent with marginal Fermi liquid. Well, I said it's constant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eric gave a talk before you. Yeah. He was talking about exponent, which is not marginal for the yes. exponent. So. Yeah. Okay, that's Q equals zero. This is only a finite Q. If mm -hmm. I go to small Q, what I get is a plasmon. Mm -hmm. And that plasmon has the same line shape as what Eric measures. And it's consistent with the sigma of omega that's a power law with omega to two-thirds and everything. I see. Mm -hmm. So if you go to finite Q, that plasmon damps away, and what you get is this. So my point is partly terminology. So you defined a marginal Fermi liquid as something that has that polarizability. So yeah. Let's take that as a definition. Yeah. Uh, whereas... Which polarizability? It, well, I don't know, density correlation function or something. Meaning... Meaning delta is equal to one half, or whatever you have... showed in that early transparencies. Yeah, that doesn't okay. agree with what we see exactly. Yeah. Okay, but at high frequency, presumably it's similar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I defined it as something that has an omega log omega in the electron self-energy. Yeah. Uh, 
All right, so those are inter definitions are interchangeably used, presumably because in the very first slide you said one implies the other. Yeah. And, and that is simply not true. Okay. It is simply not true. Oh, that you mean that, that, uh, <laughs> if, if, uh, that they're not equivalent things, they're not equivalent statements. Yeah, I agree that, with that. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. You, you said the contrary. I your, didn't say anything about the self-energy of a quasi-particle. You said it implied linear resistivity, which is simply oh, not at all Yeah, obvious. okay. Well, so you're saying that there, there's a sort of, yeah, there's an assumption how I take that thing and I compute the quasi-particle self-energy from it. And the transport and so on. And those are, those be, are highly non-obvious statements. I completely agree with which, that, yeah. Certainly in, in the, you know, that was very early days, Burma et al. claimed they were equivalent. That yeah. is simply not true. Yeah. All, but actually the functional form we see isn't exactly what that, it's not linear and constant. There's, it's different from that. So On the first slide there was also a resistivity for a spherical Fermi surface which is T squared, which is of course all oversimplification. Yeah. So the high energy physicists here I'm, I'm not, not leave, I'm not here to uh, endorse, I'm not here to endorse Chandra, I'm, I, I'm not. But, but there's a big flat thing in the data. I don't know what else to call it. I can't say it's not there. If you give me a better name, I can call it the Subir Continuum if you'd like. Yeah. I, yes, okay, I didn't, did not mean to imply that. It was, it was simply literature survey part of the talk. Yes. Peter, let's put aside for a second uh, sophisticated interpretation and look on the data. Yeah. Right? And this big flat thing. Yeah. Exactly, big flat thing. Big flat thing. So, so uh, the question is this big flat thing, is this Q dependent or not? What's no. the conclusion? No. It's not. It's not. And w can you tell what that Q dependence is? What, what, what you would, if you set aside uh, Nazir and all those things. You mean if I calculated it in if RPA? If you just plot it as function of what you showed, if you plot it as function of Q, what to well, put on plot? Well, um, these are different Qs. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't change with Q. You can, all the curves just fall on top of each other. This was in these two prior papers, so I didn't have, obviously didn't have time to review all the past work, but that was published in 2019, 2018. So it's Q independent. Right? It's Q independent. Thank you. Mike, we have one. We have one question in the back. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the uh, momentum and frequency scales that you were measuring. So, yeah. uh, within your resolution, is most of the regions for omega much less than the energy scale set by Q, or is it the other way around? To compare omega and Q, you need to give me a velocity. What's yeah. your velocity? Obviously, that's hard to determine, but... Uh, well, then I can't tell you, but, but I can give you rough, the... I can give you the... I mean, I can give you the data. Mass, right? I can give you the data, and then you can, you can decide based on your favorite velocity. So these are... This is Q. This is the inverse of the wavelength in lattice parameters. So this is 100 lattice parameters. That's 50. This is 33, 25, 20. This is energy in, in EV. Okay, so that's 1 EV. Yeah, so basically my worry is that the energy resolution is not uh, small enough to ever get into the omega much less than like VFQ regime. What's VF? The energy resolution is 6 milli EV. It's a sa very similar to what you do with, with photomission. Uh, right. So we, we measure the same kinematic range as ARPES or neutron scattering. So. Yeah, I, 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 whatever your VF is, if it's, say, the nodal velocity, that implies a line, we cross that line. So, so you go to omega much less than that line set by that VF times the yeah. Q in your... Yeah, which, is, which, was okay. ne which was not easy. Yeah, it required a lot of instrument improvements to do. Yeah. So, so Peter, can you make a little, give a, a little more precision about this Q dependence? Because can you show again the diagram, when you show which, different which cues. Uh, I mean, this, which one? This, this uh, no, no, previous one. When you said... Here? This? No, you just made the statement that there is no cue dependence. In the continuum. No, no, no. Yeah, okay, yes. Down here, there's, it's very strongly cue dependent at small q. 
When I get to Qs bigger than about 0.05, it ceases to be Q dependent. It's right here. It's, it's this. If you follow this down, this is the flat part that rises the phonon. So that is literally, it is literally this data. Uh, uh, the data, the, the, the points are the data. Yeah. The data. The data, this, this is just this curve plotted on a different scale. But you have changed the scale. I changed the scale, yeah. So this is now 0 to 300 MeV. This is a much wider range. So this looks narrower, but it's only because I changed the scale. Yeah. There's a lot of things happening on different scales here. So, so is it different constants at different scales? I, I make a general comment about the level of accuracy you are speaking. You see, you say, for example, Planckian, uh, you have Planckian dissipation. Your alpha is 0.38. Yeah. In transport, this is 0.9 plus or minus. This is Typher data. I'm not saying, but you in see it's a factor of three. It's a factor of three. So if you want, copper is Planckian. Yeah. Alpha in copper is closer to one than yours. So the level of accuracy, the level of precision of your statements is a little, let's say. Okay, I mean, that's a personal criticism, which is fine, but. No, but the, I when mean, you say it is Planckian and alpha is 0.38. Well, okay, hold on. Okay, good. Let's do this. So I, 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 I'm not saying anything has not been said. So this is true. Alpha tau naught is proportional to t. Tau naught to the minus one is proportional to t. There it is. So what we, what curve would you put through this that isn't linear? No, my statement, alpha Your is, statement is alpha needs to be one? No, I don't say it is need to be one, one. But when you say it is Planckian and your alpha is 0.38, yeah. you are, this means that for you a factor of three doesn't matter. So that, okay. That number is, yeah, the definition of Planckian is a number of order one. No, but, but also, again, I mean, there might be a difference between the number he pulls out from the relaxation rate from his fit to gamma and the alpha you're talking about, which is the number people pull out from resistivity. Well, I said, right? I said that it was the same as the one in resistivity. Now, you're talking okay. Tylefer's okay. number, which is on Lesko. This is Visco, so I think it's a valid point. Let me go verify. I looked it up and con convinced myself it was 0.4, but let me check and make sure everybody agrees on that. It's a okay. valid point. But it is linear. <laughs> and alpha is of order one. Eric has a question. Well, actually, my question was already partially answered. So you, you stated in response to Giersch that this marginal Fermi liquid contribution is Q independent. But now I'm, I'm still confused a little bit. At very small Q, is it still there, or is it just the plasma? It's, 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 it, I'll show you the data. <laughs> where, did it, where did it go? Um, yeah, so this is the continuum. And when you get the small q, it turns into something that's a little more of a bump. And that I would call a plasmon in the sense that this curve goes through it, the curve being computed from optics. Oh, no, this is, no, this was taken from experiment. Yes. And the epsilon was taken from this optical measurement. So it's just comparing one experiment to another experiment. Yeah. I don't have any opinion where this came from. It was just a, yeah. It assumes this. This is, this is general. There's no Fermi liquid assumption anywhere in this. Just, uh, I think, last question for Peter, and then we can we can turn to a more general discussion. Are from me. So you showed us a benchmark on bismuth selenide, yeah. which was a surface R plasma, non-dispersing, yeah. and because this is a, not a quasi-two-dimensional compound. Yeah. Have you ever looked at quasi-two-dimensional, yeah. but more fermi liquidish are compound where you could see the two-dimensional aplasmon dispersing. Yes, you. we did. We have a paper on strontium ruthenate in Nature just a few weeks ago where we see an acoustic excitation that matches RPA. Strontium ruthenate at low energy is a very nice fermi liquid. And if you do RPA, and Edwin did it, he's sitting back there, it agrees very nicely with the experiment. And screening between the layers makes it uh, linear, right, rather than as square rootish. That's, that's the point? 
I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, if it were a single two-dimensional layer, the plasmon would scale as square root. Yes, it's a three surface of it. Well, in that case, we actually computed the whole 3D system. Yeah. Before. Yeah. No, that's fine. As long as any, as long as any dispersion is seen, that's. Yeah. No, we have not. We have not done a 2D metal. We have not done that. But that's. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, there we're not the only group that does eels. So people have seen surface excitations in two days on, say, beryllium. There's a surface state band, and you get a gapless mode. Yeah. Question from Chandra. Okay, finally. Yeah. Message from Chandra. Yeah. There is no reason for coefficient in Peter's measurement to give you resistivity coefficient. They should be only be similar. Yeah. Number one. Number two. At very low Q, marginal Fermi liquid has a diffusive form with D proportional to T. D, the diffusion constant. Okay. Our D is temperature independent. Whatever it is. Okay. Let's thank Peter for his talk. Now...